Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. I have to say, every collector conversation is a portrait of an individual. Tastes, the journey, and ultimately, the watches are specific to each collector, and no two are alike. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Sue May, a friend of Watchbox and a collector extraordinaire. Hi, Tim. Let me ask you, how did you get into this hobby? Because if, if I can be frank, and hopefully not chauvinist, on my YouTube channel, 98% of the viewers according to statistics, according to Google, are men. So how did you discover this hobby and become so engrossed? Like watch, watches in particular or men's watches in particular? Well, I would say watches first and then ultimately how you resolve that tension between men's watches and ladies' watches. Well, I've, I've been interested in watches for a long time um, since Swatch, Swatch came out with all these diverse watches. And I think I probably bought like 20 or so in my previous life. And then I graduated from there to, you know, just buying G-Shocks, baby G-Shocks, because those, those were the sizes which fit me. And then I moved on when I started my career as a lawyer in my previous life. Uh, I had a, a little bit more money to buy women's watches, so I started a Cartier Women's, JLC, Reversal Women's, so all very tiny, small watches, as well as a Patek, which is also a women's watch. And I was quite contented then. And I'm not sure when the taste changed. I think I saw ads from Hourglass uh, promoting FP Jeune and Lange at that time in 2003, 2004. And the watches were very beautiful. So I got attracted to bigger watches and I thought, hmm, I mean, we should be able to wear big watches as maybe fashion items. So I started looking for those watches and I bought my first watch, big watch, uh, a Jeune. Octa Reserve de March in 2004. Then I, I never stopped <laughs> looking after that. Then I went to Panerai, huge 44mm watches. And I, I'm recently happy with the 38 to 40mm watches right now. I have to say that not only are our wrist size rather similar, but our tastes are rather similar as well. I don't think I've ever hosted a collector conversation where more of the watches on the table uh, spoke to me directly. And I think just one watch says it all right here. You've got the Zin 104 green, possibly the hottest watch of the last calendar year. And if I could just show that dial, this is the first example I've ever seen, and I'm into the Zin brand. Let me just ask, what about this watch captured you? How did you discover it, and when did you decide to make it yours? Also, what's up with the strap? I'm loving it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I follow watch blogs and newsletters and all that, and I think this came out in Basel this year. Um, and someone did a feature, and then I just love the iridescent dial, the green, and I like coloured dials, as you can tell. Um, and the green just called out to me, so I put an order in it, and when it came, I thought, this is really nice. And the watch straps are, because I use it for yoga, I teach yoga, I needed something which was uh, non-leather, uh, especially when I sweat on the wrist. So I looked around, um, looked for alternatives, and Barton came out. And uh, the silicon straps are really, really useful. Uh, very inexpensive, actually. And they gave me a lot of color choices, as well as came with shorter straps. I mean, this, this Barton strap is gorgeous. First of all, I thought I would have the only silicone strap on the table, but this Barton is not only by color top and bottom, but it is wonderfully pliant, supple, and comfortable. And I have to say, this is probably the best argument I've ever seen for aftermarket silicone straps. And the dial, I mean, I have to admit, this is the first time I've seen this watch. I thought it was a green dial. I saw it online, I thought, okay, it's green. In person, it's explosive. It's like there's metal flakes in there. It's a glitter bomb. That's what attracted me to it, the, the glitter on the, on the green, and the loom is fantastic as well. As a fellow Zen owner, I can tell you, it absolutely is. I now, prefer mine to yours, though. <laughs> yours is a bit too chunky for me. That's all right. We each have our own Zen, and we each have our own tastes and watches, and that's a good thing, because I never would have predicted the course that this collection would have taken, as Zen, I think, is one of your most recent watches. Uh, but for the most part, you have a very classical sensibility, and I think nothing speaks to that more than the Vacheron Triple Calendar, Historique 1942. When did you know you had to have it? When it came out. Because you see the Triple de Drune, just the case itself is so superb. Plus the Corn de Vache Lux. I mean, I mean, the one equal to it, I think, is the Ming watch, which has got 
slightly, I won't say similar lugs, but you know, the shape of the lugs are really nice and they fit quite well in the wrist because they're downturned slightly and my, I've got a small wrist, so um, I really love the case of this. And I've always been attracted by um, triple calendars and this kind of like called out to me. Well, I bought this from Watchbox actually, so yeah. Thank you for trusting us. And I also have to say that this timepiece is just as beautiful on the reverse side. If we could briefly take a look right there. Um, this timepiece is just about perfect. I think if every Vacheron were this compelling, the brand would be as strong as Patek Philippe. They, I don't know if they found a way to bottle the appeal of this watch, but if they ever could, I mean, they would pull the rug right out under from Patek. I love this watch. The only thing which I think, you know, are all these pushes which you have to adjust. Once you don't wind them, then you're like, oh my goodness, I have to put three pushes just to adjust the timing, unless you keep turning and winding the, the crown. Now, what I love <laughs> is that you are able to critically deconstruct the watches. I, I often find that when I fall in love with a watch, I look past all of its flaws and I become blind to its limitations. And you're absolutely right about the Vacheron. The pushers, as across the board, everyone needs to use something like Blanc Pain does. Uh, correctors under the lugs that you don't need pushers to activate or just control it all from the crown like IWC. I like that. I think, I, I still love the watch. It's just a bit tedious when you have to set it. So sometimes, you know, you just have to work a little bit harder if you love the watch a lot. Let's go as simple as simple gets. You mentioned Ming. Now this is the, this was the follow-up to the 2017-1701. This is the 1901. Uh, Phenomenal timepiece from Ming Tain, watch is designed in Malaysia by a noted collector, photographer and journalist and built in Switzerland. This one is very different though because the 1901 was way upscale compared to the first Ming watch and that was down to the manufacturer Schwarz Etienne movement. Why did you go for this instead of the original? Well, I actually have the original. <laughs> Okay. Both? That's the best answer. Yeah, I mean, I have the original, and but I love the movement. If I could wear the watch upside down, I would, because that's what attracted me to the watch. I mean, the two barrels. 100-hour power reserve, yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And, and really, a very impressive fusion of design and engineering, because the MSA movement is about as good as you can get, and a little bit unexpected, because even Schwarz Etienne hardly ever uses this movement. It's an exotic. I think, I think they customized it slightly for him. And his second watch, the iteration 19.02, which is the world timer, is automatic with a micro rotor. So just they just changed the movement a little bit. I think they took out one barrel. I haven't seen it yet, but it should be coming next year. They took out one barrel and they put a, a rotor on it. I'm not sure what, you know, I, I can't quite describe it because I haven't really seen it seen it in real life. I, I've seen some of the uh, some of the concepts that, that you talked about, and it, that does seem to be exactly the direction they're taking. Now, there's one feature about this watch that caught my eye, and it's the vanishing profile of the mechanism from the dial side. The crystal is actually dramatically smoked, and it's a gradient that fades from uh, dark and opaque to transparent at the edge, and it just gives a hint of what lies underneath. I love that. It's such a tease. Yeah. Yeah, it is beautiful and it, great loom at night as well. That's a fact. We don't have the tech for loom shots just yet, but that's coming. And it fits my wrist perfectly, so I think he's got, I mean, he's got the sizing right, at least for my wrist and maybe for Asian wrists. It's maybe for your wrist as well. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. We are almost wrist doubles. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, a watch that I love that I think is actually underrated because the fit's fantastic, the versatility's through the roof, and the mechanism is innovative. Uh, let me ask, why do you think that the Elegant 48 is an underrated watch? Because I think it's probably the most versatile FP Journe timepiece. Uh, what would you say to folks who say that it's not a Journe because it's quartz? I reject that notion, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, it's not, I mean, it can be considered quartz because it's battery powered, but you know, it's got so much um, invention to it in my in my thinking because, you know, the microprocessor, right? Yes. Um, you move it around, it's how fascinating how the hands move, you know, just to correct time. So it is Jean because of the idea behind it. I think he spent about eight years coming up with this exact uh, creation of the watch. Um, and look at the movement, it's fantastic. I mean, even though it's considered quartz, I don't think it's just quartz because, you know, a lot of thought has gone into it. So it's totally Jean. Jean, I mean, his creativity, the fact that he considers all his watches invented and made by him, fits his profile 
you know. That's a fact. It's quartz with charisma. That's the way I look at it. It's got that soul and that character that you'd expect from a Jorn watch. And frankly, having spoken to the factory, the way these are tested, I think this is the only Jorn that you can take swimming without any concern because of the screw down crown. Okay, I haven't tried it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not going to test the theory, but what's really the, the Titleite case? I mean, that's a very different material yeah. for Jorn. That's, that's way avant-garde between the tonneau, the quartz, and the Titleite. It's about as different from a Chronomet Souverain as you could get. Yeah, because I think the colour is different. I'm not sure how he did the Titleite. Uh, I haven't, I must confess, I haven't read much about it. I just like the colour and the way it you know, matches the straps and, um, and the differentiation with the, with the dial as well. It's an absolutely singular watch, and I have to say it's very different from everything else in your collection because with the exception of, I'm going to say, Rescence, it seems like you do like a very traditional watch, both in size and in style, and I think nothing speaks to that more than this vintage galet. You were telling me about this, your first foray into watchmaking? <laughs> well, I've always been attracted to chronographs. Uh, it started me on my chronograph path, path. I mean vintage watches, and um, I bought the newer ones first, like it brought me to Omega and then to the Langus and to other things. Then I decided to do a watchmaking course. Um, actually, the first one I went to was run by the Horological Society of New York. They came down here in, to Singapore. We took a watch apart and to put it back on and I was really fascinated by it, but I didn't understand a single thing. I was told to take this out, take this out, screw this in, take this out and I was like, I'm completely lost. But I just like the art of you know putting things together. So I actually looked at watchmaking courses and this guy called Christian Lars, uh, learnwatchmaking.com. He started with a 28, uh, no, 6827, is that the ETA Unitas? It was probably 6497 or 6497. Uh, yeah, 6497. I'm not very good with numbers as you can tell. And, and I've been do doing that uh, assembly and disassembly. So his next course is a Valju 72C. And I thought, okay, that's really challenging, but I need a movement and it's quite difficult to get. So I purchased this watch now that I'm not sure though that I'm going to take this apart because it's such a lovely watch. Now, you're, you're my new best friend because we have the same tastes and everything and it seems like we're also in the same place in our watchmaking careers. So we're, we're both working on basic movements at this point. But this is anything but a basic dial. What spoke to you about the triples, or I should say the double scale between the tachymeter and the telemeter? That's just not normal. Okay. I mean, this thing is killing me. I to love confess, it. I did not really see the tachymeter and the telemeter until you pointed it out just now. I just love the look of the dial. It's big enough to, um, I mean, big enough for my wrist and the colour and the loom and the, the dial condition was perfect. And I love the chrono and the Valju 72 movement. Not that I know very much about it right now. No, but I mean, it's, it's a great calibre. It's what you would find in a vintage Rolex Daytona. What also caught me is that not only is the dial almost spotless, but the lugs. I mean, you can clean up a dial, but you can't restore metal when it's gone. These lugs are sharp as the day they left the factory. What, did the lug style speak to you? Because I find this kind of tapered and beveled lug is the first thing that goes on a vintage watch with time. And this watch looks like it's just sailed through a time machine. I must confess, I'm not totally very, very knowledgeable about vintage watches. I just bought this and, you know, I like the dial. I like the, the look of the watch. Um, I can't even tell that it's not like polished or whatever. I just look oh, at it, it and like, yeah, you, you, so I'm glad that you You run up with so. a fantastic watch and, uh, you know, I, if, I don't know, if I had to shoplift one of these off the table, that might be the one I take. <laughs> but I, let me, I'm keeping all of them. <laughs> fair enough. Um, so let me ask you a question because we've talked a lot about the hardware, but I want to know what motivates your search for a watch. When you start off looking for a watch, uh, is it something that happens in the spur of the moment on impulse emotionally, or do you think there's a style I want, or a brand I want, or I'm looking for a complication that I don't have? Is there a process, or is it more emotional? It's quite emotional. I mean, I do have some brands which I like and I'm looking for, um, and I look for as many watches as I can find with that brand, but if it doesn't call out to me, then I'll, I'll tell myself, be patient, wait, because you know how impulsive buying can be, and I've bought quite a few watches on impulse and I've lived to regret it and thankfully we've got pre-owned markets and online shops which you can sell and Watchbox has been great about it. So mistakes are costly but they can be like reversed slightly. Now I'm a little bit careful as to how I buy my watches but I must confess it's quite emotional. I look at the dial, I see whether the colours 
the colours call out to me, the face calls out to me, the complication calls out to me, and then the brand, of course. And so I guess another question, because you, of all the collector conversations I've hosted, you've brought by far the most watches in person. I'm guessing this is not the entire collection. So do you have any philosophy about building a collection? Have you ever had a thought like maybe there's a limit to the number or there's a one in, one out kind of rule? Or do you let it grow more freely? Is, is there any kind of guiding thought about how you steer the size or the shape of your collection? Well, I actually I started when I, I I bought my first few watches, the men's watches, in 2004 to 2007. Then I stopped uh, collecting for a while because I changed careers. I became a yoga teacher. I decided that I was more focused on the physical and health aspects of my life. So I, I stopped collecting and I restarted again maybe about 2014, 2015 uh, when watch media became a bit more popular and then you see more watches being featured. and. I started with a Panerai and I went for blues. So I was looking, initially I started my collection just wanting blue, blue dialed watches. But you know, it's hard to get blue dialed watches, some are expensive and, and after, after a while it got a bit boring. So I switched around, so I don't have a particular, uh, how would I say, I don't have a particular... Collecting theme? No collecting theme, I just look at something and I decide and I see whether I like it, whether it's affordable. Uh, whether it's wearable and if it's very expensive then I have to decide should I get rid of, I mean not get rid but should I swap one or two watches for that watch and, and that's how I landed with the Laurent Ferrier I mean it's an expensive watch by my standards I had to trade in a Breitling the green dial which just came out um, Oh the Bentley? Oh you had the Bentley yeah. premiere, that's a nice watch Yes but it was too big. big for me. It's too so, big for me too, so don't yeah, So I bought it and it was too big for me, although I really was tempted to keep it. it you know, when you don't wear a watch and because it's too big, I got rid of it uh, in exchange for this, plus a Grand Seiko, um, together with the Grand Seiko, which I wasn't wearing very much as well. So I swapped it out for this. So I do have a way to control my uh, buying impulse of watches. Well, I, I do think I see a theme emerging in your collection. Aside from love for the color blue, which is represented even on this table, yeah, you, that's right. <laughs> you've got your Cartier and you've got your Omega, but at the end of the day, I look at this table and I see independence. Zinn, Atelier Wen, Ming, Laurent Ferrier. I, I would have to say that, especially given that you have a Journe on the table with them and your first foray into, into larger watches was FP Journe, most folks don't jump to an FP Journe until late in their collecting career and I think you s felt it spoke to you early on. What is it about independence and Journe specifically uh, that, that just draws your, your ardor? Because I really think that might be a theme within a theme in your collection. Uh, it's hard to say. I think I like that he's, you've mentioned that he's stubborn and you know you get along with him in, 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 in a certain way. I just like that he doesn't care what other people tells him or what, what other people's opinions are. He builds because he has a passion for it, he believes that he can do it, and he comes out with all these wonderful different movements, things you've never heard about. I mean, his only watch, the Astronomic Blue, right? Oh, yes. It's phenomenal. I was like, oh my goodness, if I had the money, I would buy it, but you know. I mean, this kind of, he's always inventing things. That's so admirable because most of the time, some watchmakers just, rely on, I mean, historical classical watches are really nice, but if you don't test yourself and push the boundaries, you don't know what can come out of it. So that's what I like about Jeanne. I mean, he's a mechanical watch person and he's been admired for them and he comes out with a quartz watch. I mean, totally unexpected, right? Yet he dares to do it and it's selling really well and it looks really well. No, it's, it's fantastic and I think just, you spoke of your Laurent Ferrier and I think I'm going to show it because I have to say, all things considered, this is a fairly brutal strap for a relatively elegant <laughs> watch. I mean, the thickness of the leather, the minimally tanned, the rusticated sheer sides and the layers, this is like a sports watch strap on a hardcore dress watch. You gotta tell me, what drew you to the watch and what drew you to the strap? <laughs> okay, the, the original strap came with a crocodile brown, to me, brown, boring brown crocodile strap or alligator strap. 
Um, I had it customized because it was short. I, you know, I always ask for short straps. But I, I found that the color was like, it just was boring. It's a dial like this. So I looked around. I've always wanted a kudu strap, especially the Moza kudu straps. But it's hard to find a independent strap maker who makes kudu straps. Looked around for a long time um, and then found Toshi Straps, this British guy, and he advertised Kudu on his on his uh, website. So I, oh my goodness, this is Kudu. So I immediately wrote to him and I said, I love the strap. I love to order a strap from you. I customized it. I didn't realize it was going to be so thick, <laughs> to be honest, because the Mosa one looked really, really nice. It's almost as thick as the watch. <laughs> so the Mosa one really looked like elegant and it fit the Mosa watch aside expected the same strap to come. Three weeks later or four weeks later, because it's customized, he sent it to me, I opened it, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is like such a big, as you say, brutal strap. And then I measured it. This is a 20mm lug size. It was 21. So I panicked. I said, it's not going to fit my lug, lux, the watch. So I wrote to uh, the guy Rich and I said, you've given me the wrong size. I measured, I videoed it, and I showed him the strap, you know, with the ruler. And I said, this is 21mm. My watch is 20mm. Um, have you made a mistake? Then he writes back, he says, Kudu is really soft. If I made it 20mm, by the time you push, push it in and, and you know, use it for a while, it might come loose. So try it. It's easy to push and you know, mold the leather to fit the lug size. I tried it. It did fit, uh, even though it's 21mm. Uh, it, I would have preferred it to be thinner, but I think it kind of goes quite well with a elegant strap. I mean, you don't have, I mean, elegant watch, you don't need to have elegant straps all the time. So uh, the beauty about having straps and the ability to change them is that you can pair them anytime with anything you want. I, I agree, and I actually think that <laughs> the contrast, the juxtaposition of the two is as attractive as it is counterintuitive right here. And you have, <laughs> I, I can see a propensity for aftermarket straps because I feel like half the watches on this table have some sort of a custom strap. <laughs> By the way, the first time I saw a kudu strap was also on Moser. And I have to be honest, when I was told it's a kudu strap, I had to like quietly Google a picture of what that animal looked like because I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't have a mental image. <laughs> this particular two-tone blue and white combo, you said it was a Barton strap on this one as well? Mm -hmm. This really completes the look of the CK2998. Um, why'd you pick the watch and why'd you go that extra mile with the strap? Okay, I've been into blue dials as I mentioned and um, this is actually my first Omega Speedmaster and the size just fits me. I like Kronos. I bought it, it came on an alligator strap um, which I use, I wear it on occasions but I like this watch to be used as a more sporty watch. So I switched straps um, just recently and Barton is wonderful, they give you short straps as well. Uh, different color, you know, dual sided straps and I looked around and I like straps to change the, the look of the watch so I just bought it and fits completely nicely. I also like what you've done, something that very few collectors do though many often, many often consider using differential color for top and bottom straps and very rarely do collectors actually follow through on their uh, threats, maybe I should say, to experiment with differential color strap ends and it really looks good on the CK. I mean, it works. Yeah. This is the best argument I've seen for that approach and it's a little bit bold, but I think it's a huge success. I think it's it's a success in the same sense that the Kudu, <laughs> the monster, the dragon skin strap is, is a success on the Laurent Ferrier. I know, I keep looking at it and I think uh, it's a bit like it doesn't fit it as well because the watch is so elegant and nice and icy blue and clean, you know, and the thin hands and then suddenly you've got this huge, big monster strap. But, you know, it, it's, it it's almost like quite a, nice. It's like a ballerina wearing combat boots. <laughs> and it's funny because you have the drive and the drive is literally, the extra thin is literally as thick as this strap. So let me know, how do you shift gears like that? What drew you to this drive? And I mean, do you think that this is the best, the, the definitive version of the drive? A watch I didn't think they got right out of the gate. Yes, yes. To me, I love the square watch. You know, Cartier was my, one of my very first watches, the tank. And uh, round watches don't really look, Cartier round watches don't really look to me very nice, but the square watch, the shape of the watch, the thinness of the watch, and the signature Cartier 
you know, Roman numerals just called out to me. So I looked at it, tried it out, and decided to buy it. It's blade-like. I mean, this is one of the thinnest watches I've seen from a mainstream brand in a long time. And it's steel, that's the thing. I, I know when this first came out, it was precious metal. Was the arrival of steel the, I guess, the deciding factor yes. to finally pull the trigger? Yes, more affordable. And also just more durable. I've had so many gold watches and it feels like I'm always trying to rationalize some scratch or dent or scuff and forget about the latest mark. And ultimately something I think like steel or the Titleite coating on the FP Journe is the way to escape that. But then I'm brought back by the romance of precious metal. And I don't think precious metal gets much more romantic than your Longa 1815 Chrono. So how did this happen? Because Longa is a dream brand for me and I think we we think alike. Well, I, you know, I, we, I mentioned that in 2004, when I first started looking at men's watches, it was Lange or FP Jeune. I decided on FP Jeune, but Lange has always been in the back of my mind. And time moved on. I got into Chronos, and then I looked at the movements. And when you talk about Chronos, the really beautiful movements are the Pateks. The Lange has been talked about quite a fair bit. Um, Omegas, well, I mean, they're quite standard. So, I mean, in terms of really beautiful movements, Langer and Patek, more Langer than Patek, I think. Uh, so I've always had my eye on, out on for Langer chronograph. It's just that the datograph is a bit too big. And, it's thick. Yes, and I'm not, I'm not certain that I like big date so much on that watch. Um, so I looked around and someone said, when, you know, you read, read watch blocks and they say this is the little brother through the datograph. Everything the same, the movement the same except for that it doesn't have the date complication. So I've been eyeing this watch and um, looking for the first gen because I think the second gen or the second gen did not have a pulse meter scale and it looked really really empty and naked. I thought it didn't really look nice. Then the third, the boutique edition came out with a pulse meter scale except that was blue. Blue numbers, everything blue, but the hands were like silver. So it didn't quite, the contrast didn't call out to me either. So I've always been looking for the first gen watch. I met Ming uh, early this year in March. He came to Singapore to um, meet some of the collectors and I met up with him to buy another watch. And we were talking about chronographs and I said, you know, my grail watch, my grail chronograph is a Langer 1815 first gen. Then he looks at me and he says, I got that. I'm like, <sighs> so I said, are you planning to sell the watch? He says, well, I've just, I bought it a couple of years ago and I'm still enjoying my watch, but if I ever do sell it, I'll think about you. And I said, yes, please, please consider me as your own, you know, first right of refusal. And he said he would. So I left it at that. Um, Six months later, I think I met him in February, I think this year. A couple of months later anyway, we were conversing and I said, you know, I'm still interested in the Lange. Are you interested in, remember, you mentioned that you give me first right of refusal. And he says, hmm, okay, maybe it's time now because he also tells me that as a maker of his own watch, um, he can't be, I mean, I think it's hard to see, be seen wearing something else. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if so you I'm were Ming, <laughs> you've got a pretty distinctive profile. Yeah. It's kind of hard to escape. Yeah, so um, we came to an agreement and he sold me his watch. He came to deliver it to me. I was like, <sighs> super excited. I mean, it's like my favorite ever watch from another watchmaker, another brand, which I really, really love as well. So how coincidental can it be? It's like, it's meant to be. Oh, it's great. You've got, you've got the Ming 1901 and you've got Ming Tain's literal <laughs> own 1815 chrono in the same collection. That's a match made in horological heaven. I think his name is pronounced as Ming Thien. Ming Thien? Well, yes. I have learned a lesson today. That's the problem with only reading names. So, speaking of names that I'm probably going to mangle, I think this is a watch that comes from a very different uh, watchmaking background. Two Frenchmen in China, <laughs> Atelier Wen, and I think this is the G model, yes. am I correct? Yes, G. G. So, we're talking very traditional, like 1950s inspired. 
uh, almost French and Swiss mid-century watchmaking design on the front, but the closer you get, the more you see the regional um, inflections of the watch on the front and the back. What drew to this watch? Because I've only just encountered the brand. I read a lot. I get a lot of newsletters and sometimes nonsense stuff and you, you know you have kickstarters and everything like that and I see the watches and then I decide okay whether I, I want to buy them and something called out to me. I mean the history, the passion behind why they made these watches, how much effort they spent in looking for the movement, coming up with the design and ex explaining the history of you know how they came up with the design and this particular blue dial took them so many iterations you know the the porcelain white dial which you reviewed uh, recently came out first maybe three four five months ago they had a lot of difficulty getting the blue done very well and i think they had to throw the initial bat batches of uh, dials away so this only came a couple of weeks ago about a month ago so i'm still getting used to it but i think you know they spend so much time trying to make things perfect they didn't like fob off all the initial uh, blue dials which were like maybe I'm not sure what happened but I think they were like it was not consistent in terms of the material being applied and I like that they probably lost money spent a lot of time um, redoing the dials um, it, it it speaks a lot for them and and hopefully they've got a great hopefully they have a great future ahead of them and they're an incredible, I mean, from, from a purely intuitive standpoint, I think all their instincts are right. The lug shape, the dial form, the shape of the hands, the embellishments, the cabochon on the dial, and the size of it's very much yeah. of our time. If this, were, if this came out in the 2000s, it would have been 45 millimeters and neither of us could have worn it. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is an awesome watch. I think it's a limited edition, is it? Of um, 150 or 200, I think. Yeah, and it's a very special watch with a porcelain dial, and I, I would emphasize to our viewers at home, a porcelain dial is basically a sort of fired gloss ceramic in this application. So it has the same luster and aesthetic qualities of enamel as well as the anti-aging tarnish resistance, uh, but it is a ceramic disc much like what you'll find on a modern day Omega timepiece, and very artfully rendered with the metallic cabochon additions. And on the back, again, I'm at a risk to, ma to mangle the term, but I think this is a kunpeng. It's a mythological bird, and it has wonderful relief depth and a sort of sculptural quality that you don't often find on solid caseback watches. Yeah. Even, and the detailing here is outstanding, even the strap itself features discrete expressions of the cultural heritage of the watch. So that's a really, that's a feature dense watch for I think, What's mm. a, a very young brand. I think they hit all the right notes. I'm, I'm excited to see what their, their sophomore effort is, but I think those two young gentlemen from France are on a great start. Uh, speaking of a watch that continues your, your blue dial theme, and now we're going to enter Belgium. But <laughs> Resins, you like your independence, and this is clearly in that vein, but this is a very different kind of display. How did you get into Resins? Through you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, you did a review of this watch in one of your programs and when you explained it and I looked at the dial, I just was fascinated by the dial. I mean, uh, it's a regulator dial, right? That's correct. And basically it moves around and it gives you a different look all the time. I mean, how, how you know, I like, as you can tell, I, I like variations in my watch watches. I like differences. So this called out to me in terms of the, the face changing all the time. Uh, when you look at it, every time, it, and it makes you think about um, reading the time as well. So I, I guess something quite different from my typical watches. So it makes you it makes you think about the time more. Yeah. I find that you know conventional watch it becomes second nature, but with Resonance, the regulator dial is different, and it's wacky and it's crazy. But it makes you think more about interacting with your watch. It's almost like it forces you to acknowledge the watch yeah. twice. Once the look and the second the read. Mm -hmm. And I, I do love that. And it's a wonderfully thin watch for Yeah. It fits me. Actually I thought it'd be too big for me, but then when you reviewed it and you said it fits a 14 cent centimeter wrist and I thought, okay, okay, I'll trust him. I bought it and from Watchbox and I actually saved the video because this was the exact watch you reviewed. Oh video. sweet, what's an old friend? Yeah. I love reunions. <laughs> Excellent. So let me ask you, because you've got an incredible collection and it's clear that you like to live your dreams from Vacheron to Laurent Ferrier, F.P. Journe, Langa, and especially that Zen. That's a sizzling Zen. What does the future look like? I mean, 
A lot of folks think, well, you start with simple watches, you work up to complicated watches, basic brands to great brands, but it's not always that linear. What, what do you see down the path for your collection and your evolution as a collector? Hmm. And that could include grail watches. It, it's fair to have a new grail, even though you've added the 1815. Well, I'm looking at more independence. Um, Recepi, Acrivia, the chrono, chronometer contemporary, right? I like his watches um, and um, that's one thing I'm eyeing, his second series one because the first series is probably it's all gone. Actually I regret it, I regret missing out on it because my, my, my dealer from Hourglass called me and he says, would you like to put a, would you like to buy the watch? And I'm thinking I don't know this guy, his first time, at that time uh, he was nominated for GPHG, right? Hadn't won yet and I was hesitant because it's a really expensive watch. And then when it sold out, it's always regret that you missed out on it. But maybe the dials didn't call out to me. I wasn't interested in a um, rose gold dial with the black one, which was nice, but I'm not into rose gold uh, cases. So I gave a pass on it and I didn't quite uh, like the white gold one as much. So I'm regretting not getting the watch in the sense that it's sold out, but Part of me is quite relieved that I didn't get it either because I'm looking forward to his next iteration because I'm sure he'll create something different or similar but better. I hope. No, oh, it's it's great, and I, we all have our we have everyone has buyers for more stories. We have you and I non buyers for more <laughs> series. Um, like I regret not getting the original Omega X thirty three. Yours is better. You, your, your non buyer's remorse is not getting the Chronomet Contemporary. Well, but I couldn't afford it, so you know it's not that. I, I was just a fool. I have no excuse. I should have <laughs> gone for it when I had the chance. So that's impressive. I mean, that's the Grail of Grails, you know, in a Crivia, and I think. Uh, as I've come along as a collector, I've had grails come and grails go, and I think the great pleasure has been the eventual capture when you finally wear that grail watch. And it's been just a pleasure understanding your journey as a collector. What advice would you give to people who are where you were back in 2004, about to buy that first big watch? Is it let your heart be your guide? Plan ahead? More emotion, less emotion? More emotion, actually more emotion. Let your heart be your guide. Because if you buy just based on value and what you think the investment value is, um, it's not going to satisfy you. Um, if you like the watch for itself, irrespective of the brand, irrespective, okay, maybe not irrespective of the price, something which is affordable, but something you love, I think you'll, you, you will carry the watch with you for a longer time and it will mean much more to you uh, than it would um, just an expensive or uh, a uh, brand which is sought after by, by many people. That's what I feel. Sume, thank you so much. I appreciate this. Thank you. You've been a wealth of knowledge, actually. You, you mentioned things which uh, I don't quite... Well, I haven't read all about all my watches, so I have to brush up on my study of all the <laughs> watches which I own. Well, this hobby is a continuous learning process. I didn't know how to pronounce Ming's name. Now I do. <laughs> Thanks to you. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.